Well, hey, good morning. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here with us today on this potentially rainy, snowy, whatever it's going to do day. It also might be, you know, 65 and sunny because it's Texas and that's just how things are. Uh, but I'm excited about this morning. I'm excited about this sermon uh, today and the subject we're talking about. We're in a new series, as Jeff said, about beyond. God is bigger, God is grander, God is more uh, than you think he is. And I'm excited about it um, because we're in Exodus chapter 3 today, which is the story of the burning bush. God is giving his name to Moses. And it got me thinking about names. It got me thinking about what do people think of when they say your name? And I don't mean like, what does your name mean? Like my name is apparently French for from the crossroads. I don't know how that happens, but that's what it means. Um, but what do people think of when they, they say, like if somebody were to point out and say, hey, who's that? And I would be like, oh, that's just Rodney. Nobody important. It's just Rodney Shell. Not a big deal. Or if I were like, oh, that's Rodney. That's the executive pastor of Park City's Baptist Church. He's a big deal. Or what if there's some names we treat with more gravity than others, right? If I were to say, sitting on the front row, here's Jeff Bezos. She'd be like, oh, that's a big deal. Elon Musk, big deal. Beyonce, the queen bee herself, is here today. We'd have gravity and weight and significance in that. We have a, a, a problem in our relationship with the Lord. And it, it's not necessarily a, a bad problem. It's just a struggle because we're finite human beings. And because we're finite human beings, the fact that God is infinite is hard to get our minds around. That makes sense. So oftentimes what happens to us is we have a God that's either too big or too small. He's too big and we feel like he's unrelatable because he is infinite. We get it and we're like, oh man, why would a God like that want anything to do with a person like me? Or he's too small. We think, oh man, like I can't get my head around this. So, so God, you're, you're just not big enough for my problems. You, you, we kind of take him for granted, right? Like, oh, that's just God. That's just Jesus. I've heard it before, right? So we kind of live in this between two polar opposites of this infinite God that infinitely wants to know us and relate to us. And so what I want us to do today is we talk about the infinite nature of God and we look at Exodus chapter three. I want us to, to be comfortable or, or grow in comfort in this tension that we live in between the infinite nature of God and his relatability. And we're gonna look at it really through the lens of three, three tensions. The first one is that God is not restricted. He's not restricted. Uh, God's people essentially have a problem in Exodus and that they're, it's that they're enslaved. And the guy that God has picked to deliver them isn't even in Egypt. His name is Moses. And so God has to go and get Moses and bring him uh, to the, the point uh, where he can, he can come and deliver them. So we're in Exodus chapter 3, and it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And I'm going to keep going into verse four. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. So if you, if you were paying attention, there's, there's something that appears to be a contradiction here. It looks like there's the angel of the Lord that's in the bush but then God starts talking. So what's happening? Is this, is this two different sources kind of being put together and, and it's confusing? Like one person said the angel of the Lord, one person said God, and they put it together and they just didn't edit it right? One of the commentators I read this week, and I really liked this perspective, was that the, the Hebrew author has such a, a respect and an awe for the, the majesty and the infinite nature of God that he's not going to confine God to a piece of shrubbery. So the fire is the angel of the Lord. It's going to appear to be the angel of the Lord. And sometimes in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is worshipped, which is kind of strange. Angels aren't worshipped. And so it's almost like the author saying, God is not confined to a place, a location, but it's still God that speaks out of the bush. So the, angel, the, the writer's doing these kind of gymnastics with the language to help you see, we're not gonna, God's not the God of the shrubbery. He's not the God of the mountain. He's not the God of fire. He's much bigger than this. But I'm still have him speak because it was God speaking out of the bush. God's not localized to a place, a time, uh, really even to a people group. He's not the God of vegetation or the mountain. He's not localized, he's not compartmentalized. Zeus was the God of lightning, right? Poseidon was the god of the sea. Aphrodite was the goddess of lust and love. 
Baal was the God of fertility. God's not the God of insert your box. But what happens is in our life, because we're trying to relate to God, I think we try to make God, we we let pagan worship kind of infiltrate our worship. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when do we go to God? When do we spend time with God? When we're sick? Yeah, God is the God of the sick. When we're scared? God is the God of the terrified. Maybe when business is going well, I put a Jesus fish on my business, so that means God's going to bless my business. Or I'm going to honor my family, and my family's going to honor God, and that means nothing's ever going to go wrong in my family ever. We let these pagan ideas infiltrate our worship, and I think one of the reasons why we do it is because we can't get our head around an infinite God. God is not restricted to the boxes that we try to put him in. His infinite nature means that that can't happen. And it means that he's not just quantitatively bigger. He's qualitatively bigger. What do I mean by that? Well, it means whatever God is, he is that to a boundless degree. So what do we know about God? We know he's holy. We know he's powerful. We know he's knowing. He's righteous. He's loving. He's gracious. He's merciful. And he's all of these things to an infinite degree. That means it's exhaustless. So you can't outlove God. You can't sin to the point where God's like, I'm done. Because he's infinite and he is love. He's limitless. That means his mercy is limitless. He knows no bounds. It also means that he's unflawed. So his love is unflawed. It means however God chooses to love us, it is the best, most perfect way to love that can be conceived of. In fact, we can't even really conceive of it. That's what it means to be infinitely loving. It means it's boundless in potential. Think about that, boundless in potential, right? What can God do? There are some limits on what God can do. We'll probably talk about this a little bit more next week. God can't violate his own character, so God cannot sin. God cannot lie. He can't break a promise. There are things God cannot do that his infinite nature doesn't cover, but he's only limited by his own character. It also means that God is infinitely immense. Now, what do I mean by immense? Does that mean that God ate too much at Christmas and he's grown? No. It's another way of saying omnipresent. And I like it better than omnipresent. One, I think omnipresent sounds strange. Immense means that God is equally present at all points at all times. So it's not like Rodney gets 20% of God this week because God, he needs God a little bit more than I do and I only get him 10% this week. I'm going to need God this week because I keep picking on Rodney. It means that God is 100% with Rodney, 100% with TJ, 100% with me, 100% with Ashley, 100% with with my wife. He is 100% with everybody at all times, fully present. So we tend to deny his infinite character when we say things like this. And, And we don't mean to, it just is infiltrated our worship. Hey God, if you've got time, God, if you've got time, would you listen to me? God's always got time. God exists outside of time. Hey, God, I know you're busy, but guess what? Yeah, he's busy, but he's boundless. So he can be busy doing a thousand other things and still pay attention to you. And in fact, he is paying attention to you right now. God, if you'll just listen for a minute, God's always listening. He's not like me on my cell phone when my wife's talking to me, which is I'm, not, I'm distracted and not listening. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you got in trouble for it today. God's always giving you his full attention and giving his full attention to literally everything else in existence. And I think the reason why we do this, why we say these things is because we just can't get our head around an infinite God. But know this, God is a God who is not restricted, but he is revealed. He has revealed himself. Look back at verse four. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Look how loving this action is. Look at the steps God goes through. One, he even takes the time to condescend to appear to Moses in a form that Moses could even relate to. Fire in a burning bush. He didn't give Moses the full weight of his glory because it would have killed him. And then he calls to him, he says, Moses, Moses. It's like this tender, gentle calling. 
And then he tells Moses, hey, take your sandals off your feet. This is holy ground. If you're going to interact with me, this is how you do it. A capricious God would have been like, you didn't act right and smack him down. He doesn't do that to him. He tells him exactly how he's supposed to interact with him. And then he says, I'm the God of your father and I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He relates to him through his family. He's like, oh yeah, I knew your dad and I knew your dad's dad and I knew your dad's dad, dad. God relates to us. He wants to relate to us. He wants to reveal himself to us. God is big and the temptation is to make him smaller so that we can interact with him. Here's the thing, that's not your job. You don't have to do that. That's an extra step. We're all about life hacks. Here's a life hack for you. You don't have to make God smaller. He does it for you. He will relate to you. That's what his word is. That's what scripture is. It is him revealing himself to us that we might know him. If God didn't want us to know anything about him, guess what? He would be the greatest hide and seek champion of all time. We'd never find him. But he does want us to know him. So what do we do with this? One, you need to be committed to being in scripture. If that's how he's chosen to reveal himself in his word, then, then be in scripture. He's also revealed himself through creation. He's revealed himself through his son. And that's the ultimate revelation of God. So God didn't think, think enough just to, to speak out of a bush. He said, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to live and dwell amongst human beings for 30 plus years so that they can know me and I can show myself to them. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. 100% God, 100% man, dwelling amongst men. And what we tend to do is we tend to have, uh, did you ever see your, your, your teacher when you were a kid outside of school? It was weird because like they're supposed to live at school, right? You see him at the movies and you're like, Mr. Smith, you watch a movie? We have these like places where we leave God, these boxes we put him in and we want to interact with him outside. It's weird. So whatever you do this week to interact with God, interact with him in different places. Maybe set an alarm on your phone and be like, rather than in the evening when I, when I normally spend time with the Lord, I'm going to try the morning this week just to get out of my box, just to, just to let myself know that God is in control of every part of my life. I'm going to worship him at work today. So set an alarm. Uh, Sam Holm uh, used to have an alarm, I think he still does, for, uh, set for 222 to pray for his kids. I always thought that was really cool, 222, pray for his, his wife and his kids. Set an alarm to interact with God at a strange time of day. Just to, to know that God is bigger, he's more infinite than you can realize. And to appreciate him for that and know that he still wants to be with you. He still wants to talk to you. So God's infinite, he's uh, not restricted, he's revealed himself though. He's also not surprised in his infinite nature, he's not surprised. You get the idea when you start reading Exodus, uh, it's a little bit of a cat in a hat scenario where God has left the kids at home and they've gone and gotten themselves enslaved uh, by the Egyptians. Uh, and like God comes back and is like, oh my gosh, what in the world has happened? I leave you alone for 400 years and this is what takes place? It's almost like God is surprised but he's not surprised. He's not surprised that's what's happening. In fact, in Genesis uh, chapter 15, verses 13 to 14, he tells Abraham, he says, as he's making a covenant with Abraham, an agreement with Abraham, he says, look, you're go then he's gonna say, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. And, and that's from Exodus. He's gonna say, look, I know for a fact that you are going to be enslaved. You're gonna go down to, and be enslaved by people that are not your people, and I'm gonna deliver them with a strong, mighty, powerful hand. And you know what happens in the book of Exodus? This is what he says in verse seven. Look how much, how deep God's knowledge goes, starting in verse seven. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. Okay, so real quick, there's a couple things here. Uh, he says, I've seen, and then he says, I know. So some commentators believe that these are two different ways of knowing. The I've seen is the same way in which we watched what happened at the Capitol this week. Usually, most of us probably watched it on the news. We saw it from a third-party perspective, and we knew that it was happening. But we didn't know or experience the terror, the confusion of the people that were there, the panic, the anger. We didn't experience that firsthand. So God, in seeing, sees it, so he watches it, but then he also knows. He knows every single whiplash that hit an Israelite's back. He knows the backbreaking labor that they had. He knows it all. He's not surprised by it. He's not caught off guard by it. Look, out, look what else it says in verse eight. 
And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. He knows where he's taking the people of Israel. He knows who's already there and he knows that they're not going to be there for long because God's going to move them out. He knows that the land he's bringing them to is fruitful. Verse 9, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel have come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. See how much he knows about them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He knows that Moses is going to be the one to do this. He knows everything. His knowledge of this situation is infinite, and it's deep, and it's rich. God knows absolutely everything that is going on everywhere at all times. So what does his infinite knowledge mean? It means his knowledge is complete. God knows everything. God knows every possibility. He knows every hypothetical situation. So when we ask questions like, you know, as a history buff, people ask questions like, well, what would have happened if Hitler had won World War II? God knows what would have happened. God doesn't just know events. So we tend to know events chronologically, right? So like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. God knows events and their consequences. So for instance, um, you're going to have Whataburger for lunch today. Probably, because that's delicious. And, and God knows that that's going to give you indigestion and that you're going to uh, be indisposed this afternoon during a crucial part of the game that you're really excited about watching and that's going to make you grumpy for the rest of the day. God knows all of that whole story. And he loves you anyway. He knows how the events that took place in the Capitol this week are going to have ramifications throughout our country and throughout our world and what ramifications they're not going to have. He knows his knowledge is not gained through observation, deduction, or inference. God doesn't learn, okay? We learn sequentially, right? So I learned algebra one, then algebra two, and then somebody tried to teach me trigonometry and they failed, and then someone tried to teach me calculus and they failed, God doesn't learn sequentially. God knows all things simultaneously. That is what it means to be infinitely knowledgeable. Also, he knows himself fully. So a lot of us are on a voyage of discovery of ourself. We're learning ourselves. God isn't learning himself. He knows himself fully. And what's more is he knows everything that has been created from himself fully as well. His knowledge is complete. So it should be very clear that God is not surprised. He's not surprised about this virus that's uh, ravaged us. He's not surprised that people keep keep dying from it. He's not surprised that our hospitals are swelling. He's not surprised that you're not enjoying your job. He's not surprised about what happened at the Capitol building this week. He's not surprised ever. And so that begs the question, Travis, why doesn't he do something about it? If he's not surprised, why doesn't he do something about it? Well, here's what you need to know, and that's a huge question. That's the question, right? God is not surprised, but he is sympathetic. God is sympathetic. Look back at the passage again, and I'm not going to read it again, but but think of the highlights from it. He says, I, repeatedly, in verses 7 to 12. I've seen, I know, I'm come down, I'm going to do this. He has a personal vested interest in the Israelites. His knowledge isn't just factual, it's intimate. He's he's, He's through the Israelites, he knows the pain and suffering that they're going through, and he hurts with them. He says, I've come down to deliver them. So this isn't just like, I'm going to send Moses to do this, and you just let me know. Send me an email when you're done, and and I'll know you made it. No, he's like, I've come down. I'm going with you, Moses. We're going to do this. God knows how everything you're going through is affecting you and how it doesn't affect you. He knows that you might be sick. He knows that you might be scared. He knows that you might be worried. He knows that you might be joyful. He knows how things elate you and how things crush you. He knows that. And what's more than God just being a sympathetic God, God is also an empathetic God. Again, we go to Jesus. God puts on flesh, dwells amongst men for 30 plus years, experiencing the things we experience. Jesus experienced pretty much everything we experience with the exception of sin. And that he was tempted for to the utmost degree. So when you sin, when you screw up, you can go to Jesus and be like, Jesus, I know you don't know what it's like to sin, but you know what it's like to be tempted and you know how hard it is for a human being to resist temptation and I'm sorry that I fell. And you know what? He's like, yeah, I know exactly what that's like. Jesus, you know exactly what it's like to suffer. Yeah, I do, because I suffered for you. Jesus, you know exactly what it's like to lose a parent. Yeah, I buried my adopted father, Joseph. 
Jesus, you know what it's like to be misunderstood? Yeah, I was betrayed by one of my best friends. Totally get it. Jesus' knowledge goes beyond just factual knowledge. It is empathetic, sympathetic knowledge. He's experienced what we've experienced, and he wants us to know that about him, that he's not surprised by it, and he's right in the middle of it with us. He loves us. And so that should lead us to also act in the same way with other people. God knows, again, he doesn't have to learn, but we do have to learn. So we should know what's going on in the lives of other people. Ask questions of others. Hey, how's it going? Oh, it's okay. Really? Is it really okay? Push people. Tell me about your life. And then sympathize. Golly, that's got to be hard. I am so sorry. And then empathize. Get in the mess with them. How can I help? This is, I'm going to bring you a meal this week. That may not be what you need, so tell me what you need. But if you don't tell me otherwise, you're getting a casserole. <laughs> empathize with people. If that's what our God does with us, why do we not do it? We should be the best at it. God is not surprised, and he's completely sympathetic. He's empathetic with us. This brings us to our last tension. God is not nameable. That should give you a little bit of pause. We'll get there. God is not nameable. Look at verse 13, because Moses asks a great question. Great question. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. God gives him his name. And this is not a name that you and I would come up with, because if we were to come up with a name like this, we would, if we were to name God, we would have it associate with what we want him to do, Right? So we need him to deliver Israel out of Egypt, so he's going to be the God that saves. That would be a title we would give him, be saving God, right? Who comes up with I am who I say I am? That's not a human invented name. It can't be. It doesn't make any sense. But God says, I'm going to name myself. And the best way I can capture for you who I am is to tell you that I am who I say I am. What does that mean? It means that God's name isn't so much as a name. It's a description of his existence. This is who Moses is dealing with because God's not the God of the sun or the God of the air or the God of the dead. God is the God of everything. And that's a really long title. So he says, I am who I say I am. It says he's infinite. He says his nature is grand. This word, this Hebrew word, uh, I was reading Thomas Oden this week, which you don't know him. He's a theologian, passed away a couple years ago. He's fantastic. I, I highly recommend Thomas Oden. He says it's an, an intensification of the verb to be, which means I have existed before all things existed and I will exist long after everything stops to exist if it does. It means it's self-sufficient. So Zeus, the Greek god Zeus, great Zeus, was the son of Kronos, who was the son of Uranus. Guess who God is the son of? No one. I am who I say I am. He has no patronage. He's self-sufficient. In many ways, I am who I say I am describes God better than anything we could ever invent or come up with. It points to his infinite nature. So God is not nameable by us. Now, we do give him titles, yes, the God who saves. But when it comes to his name, his first name, he names himself. He names himself. And this should give us great pause when we approach God and our worship of the Lord. Why? Why? Because look what Moses does in verse 6. Go back to verse 6. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was what? Afraid to look at God. The infinite nature of God should make us afraid. In fact, Job 28, 28, Psalm 111, 10, Proverbs 1, 7, 9, 10, 15, 33, Isaiah 11, 2, and Isaiah 33, 6, and Micah 6, 9 all say the same thing. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In fact, that's our memory verse for this week. Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, what do I mean by the fear of the Lord? Does that mean to be terrified of God? Absolutely not. God is not abusive. He's not manipulative. You don't need to be terrified of him. But fear of the Lord commands a whole lot more than just respect. We've kind of lessened that a little bit. Because I respect a lot of things. I respect the Mets, even though I hate them, you know. Respect is something that, that, that is, is offered, but fear, that's awe. 
That's inspired. That's, that's simultaneously, again, this tension that we live in, live in of I am completely and totally drawn to this being that I derive my entire existence from and who could snuff me out in an instant and I wouldn't know about it. I'm drawn to him and I can't stay away from him and he continues to call to me and at the same time, I am keenly aware of the fact that I have zero right to be in his presence. That's fear of the Lord. And that leads to a life of wisdom. Alan Ross said this, wisdom is the ability and discipline to live a productive and honorable life in compliance with the word of God. It is God given. And so by faith, the believer will seek to live a moral and righteous life and submitting one's will to the sovereign will. That's fear of the Lord. If you want to sum it up, fear of the Lord is submitting my will to the sovereign's will. It's saying, God, you are infinite. Now be infinite in my life. I give myself to you. Again, it's not terror. I'm not terrified of God. You shouldn't be. Jesus buys us freedom from that. So God is not nameable, but here's the thing. He is knowable. He's knowable. Notice what it says at the end of verse 15. It says, this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. That remembered, it doesn't just mean like, oh yeah, God, he's cool. I remember him. It's like the idea of a memorial, right? So when you go to a memorial service, there's opportunity for people to remember the deceased, right? And people stand up there and they tell stories about the person, stories that they appreciated about them, they loved them. God wants us to remember him. And we can only really remember him if we know him. Imagine giving a eulogy for somebody that you didn't know. That's awkward. God wants us to remember him because we know him and draw close to him. He desires for us to know him, to remember him. We're about to take the Lord's Supper. And Jesus says on the day day before he's killed, he says, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. In fact, God wants to know us so much and he he wants us to know him so much that he puts on flesh, dwells among us, and there's this barrier between us and God. And the reason there's a barrier there is because all of us have failed to fear God the way that we should. And that's called sin. And so it creates this barrier between us and God. And so what happens is, God stands in the gap for us, sending his son. Jesus dies. He pays the penalty for our sin. He's raised to life again, and he says, God wants to know you so much that Jesus is willing to die for you. So why, do we, why are we so scared in a terrified sense? Why do we think God looks down on us with such displeasure and disfavor? Why would I give up my own child to get a whole bunch of people for myself that I could then just look down on negatively? It makes zero sense. I can judge people from afar just as easily. But I can't know people unless I know them close up. God desires to draw you in, to draw you closely. And today might be a burning bush moment for you. This might be the day that God's calling to you and you're gonna turn aside from whatever it is that you're pursuing, whatever life you're living, and he's saying, hey, come here. And he's calling your name, he's calling it twice. Take off your sandals, stay a while. I want us to talk to you today because my son died for you and I want to know you and I want you to know me and everything you've ever thought about me. That's just a little picture. I'm way bigger than you think I am. And maybe for some of us, we've been doing the church thing for so long that our God's real small. He's in a box. That happens. We're creatures of habit. We like what we like, we read who we read, we get in, get in a rut, I get it. But your God is much larger than you probably remember. And he's called you to remember that. Wake up, turn aside, come see the grandness of your God who is so immense and so huge and so unrestricted and so not surprised and so not nameable, but he's given himself a name and is the name Jesus Christ. And that name says to you, I've revealed myself to you. I've shown myself to you. I'm sympathetic. I'm empathetic. I know what you're going through and I want to go through it with you. Now come get to know me because I know you and I love you. That is what your God, your big God, your infinite God is saying to you today. So how do we live in that tension every day? 
He's not restricted, he's revealed himself. He's not surprised, but he's sympathetic. He's not nameable, but he is knowable. And we live in that every day. And that's our life, that's how we worship an infinite God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, as we come to the table and we do what you've asked us to do, what you've called us to do, to remember, Lord, I pray for each person in this room that they would remember And they wouldn't just remember, Lord, what you've done for them. You'd remember what you've done for everyone. And the great grace that you've shown to this world, even by making yourself known, and putting on flesh, dwelling among us, and then paying the penalty for our sins. May you be honored as the infinite God you are. Give us, empower us to be the worshipers we need to be. That's in your son's name we pray. Amen.